Warning, the voices heard in this video are made synthetically using artificial intelligence. Nothing in this video reflects anything actually stated by the real-life individuals involved. This video is for entertainment purposes only, and serious political content will be avoided for that purpose. Enjoy! The original orders returned to the optimistic viewers' observing eyes, kicking it right off with the win encounter that we couldn't get last episode. How are we doing, boys? Greetings, my lovely and adoring audience. I am back once again. I know you all missed me, but I'm back with the high balls gameplay and base takes. The law thought they could stop me from doing this series, but they simply forgot that I am built different and can't be stopped. You're right, he didn't watch the special episode, Barry. Donald, we already ratted you out to the viewers that you skipped my episode because you'd rather go to a McDonald's convention than play a DLC without Morrigan. You goddamn liberal rats, so I bought both of you McDonald's this morning, ensuring your silence for nothing. Get out, played big dog. Well, no matter what, it's good to be back with the OG squad while we check on the OG squad. Wynn is just telling us how she is only being kept alive by a spirit of faith. I have to admit, it's an interesting setup for a character's premise, someone being kept alive by something else without too much time left. I feel like we could have done something deeper with the execution than what we get. So Sleepy, does any of what Wynn is describing sound familiar? Because the way you struggle upstairs, I have to wonder what is keeping you alive, because it's definitely not your old ass organs alone. You caught me, Donald. I've been kept alive by a spirit of plowing your mother. If I don't take her to pound town every Sunday, my heart fails, it's really stressful. Damn, Joe, if only you had this striking of blows on the debate stand, you might have actually made an impact. Well, I don't know. I think I clutched when I pulled the felon card on you, Double D. Uh, I missed the easy distractibility of you two idiots. It's really refreshing. Anyway, viewers, this is going to be a very heavy win and Zevran episode today based on all the places we are going to today. I'm going to the Pearl to wrap up a few Daenerim quests, then I will be tackling the second win encounter before I head to the Dalish camp to start our next main quest, as well as Wynn's regret companion quest. As always, get a nice chilled cup of lean for this filler episode and put a thermometer in that shit to keep it at a cold 40 degrees or five Celsius if you're not a true freedom believer. Jesus Christ, of course your ass would pull that again. But whatever talking to win is like talking to a boring ant at Thanksgiving dinner, it's best to be high as shit before you even begin. Guys, Wynn is not that bad. Sure, she's long-winded, but she has a reason. Let's just move on to Uncle Ogren next. Bro's still not opening up. He clearly well, needs his happy Gordon. juice. Well, he must already be drunk enough because who in their right mind would prefer the surface to the glorious dungeon and sturdy, secure walls of Orzammar? Trust me, Ogren. What about? After these next two main quests, we have to do. You are going to be hammering at the walls to get back into based Orzammar lands, believe me. Important to note, he basically only focused on how the surface doesn't know who he is or judges him. It wasn't anything positive specifically about the surface. Good therapy, Pullberry. Once we tackle his companion quest, we can finally achieve war buddy status with him, and we can get the full picture. So we have a good introduction to his character arc in Awakening. Speaking of, I'm wondering if the dialogue restoration mod gives us the option to import Ogren's approval to Awakening. I'm not sure if it does, but it would be really nice if it did. What's true that? I hate how Ogren acts brand new by the time of Awakening, despite it being six months after this game. Like, yeah, we were bros six months ago, but now I don't know you. I already deal with that with Pence. I don't need it in my video games. Well, I guess Barry's going to hit up all three of the companions that still have arcs to explore. Is that really surprising? Not only is Zevran Barak's type, but Obama always has to be a registered therapist in his episodes. He did the same in his last two episodes, and he's doing it now. You know, you keep clowning me on Zevran, but I know damn well you're going to go off the deep end for like half of Dragon Age 2's cast. I mean, there's Isabella, but I don't know who else. What do you mean? He's referring to a certain lanky elf Donald. I don't care about Meryl. That's all your department, Joe. Don't bother, Joe. You'll see what we mean when we get there, Donald. All right, keep your secrets anyways. Barack, I see what you're doing here. Asking about Zevran's adventures, he has two we can get through now. And the last one, he's going to keep shut tight like Hillary's emails until we confront Taliesin at the end of the game. Wait, did Donald just dispense lore? Who are you and what did you do with Double D? 
Oh my God, have both of you started reading my notes finally? Are we about to level up our videos? Don't get your panties in a twist, Obama. I'm not reading your goddamn binder with color-coded notes it took you 12 years to make. I've just been watching a few Gill videos between trials to finish up this series strong. Besides, you either die from hearing one to many yaps, or you live long enough to become a yapper yourself. And six months of this shit has definitely turned me into one. I mean, I will take the small amount of character development for what it is. The first two stories, while not as dramatic as the last story, are still interesting. This story in particular shows that Zevran never was a cold-blooded killer and actually spared his first target only for her to fall off the carriage and break her neck. I may not like this guy, but he has some max luck fallout build if he can just make his targets die like that without lifting a finger. Bro got played by a girl who gave him some tail and tried to turn and run after. This is reason number 15 why you should never simp for a filthy mage. Unless, of course, she has purple eyeliner, a purple robe, and a goth dominatrix persona. Then, by all means, let her take you for everything you're worth. I'm glad you said that exception. The viewers would have started to think you're a hypocrite. Damn, we are getting really meta today, huh, boys? I feel like that always happens when we go through the companion section. You know, hearing this story about how sparing a mage got him laid, I think I need to redirect our objection to Zevran, wanting to spare the mages in Broken Circle. Bro probably wanted round two this time, with the whole circle giving him a thankful mage orgy. Zevran's secondary objective is probably to discover some kind of orgy in his journeys with the Warden. Thank God he doesn't ever have to interact with the Desire Demon. Bro would be more cooked than you two horny bastards are. Oh, don't act like you aren't the first person to look up Desire Demon, ex Zevran, fan fiction, Barak, you got your itches, same as everyone else. No comment. Anyway, with both these stories, the main thing I like is how believable they both are. He doesn't overhype himself or embellish the stories he tells are interesting, but ultimately don't make him look very competent or cool, which is the best indicator that what he is telling is the full truth. It's the same logic that can be applied across the Dragon Age franchise, the main example being Corypheus, when he says, the Black City was already corrupt. We can figure that is true because it makes him look pathetic when he could have easily lied about how he succeeded. I like how these stories give a really clear picture of how Antiva operates. If Veilgard doesn't take notes from how Zevran described Antiva, it's a massive fumble, this city sounds lively and chaotic. True good shit on that one, Donald. Well, besides the two gifts we have for Zevran, that's all we can get out of him for a while. We can get both his companion-specific gifts in the next two main quests, though, so we still have some content to give him. Let's head to the Pearl. Now, this is my kind of place. I can already tell Bill had huge influence on the Pearl. They just don't make games like they used to. You can bang everything to your heart's content in this area, and there's a little something for everyone here. I mean, not my cup of tea, but you're right. I'd rather they have places like this to match the setting than to outright remove them plus the surprise me memes. In both this game and Dragon Age 2 slap hard, I already know these places went the way of the dodo bird though, so rest in peace to you two horny bastards. Well, careful Joe, because you're in the splash zone right now. Let's go talk to our future Dragon Age 2 companion, shall we? Oh my God, my pirate queen. Jeff Yohu and Fiddle Me Mommy. That's a new one, but at least we didn't evolve into Swedish that time. The circumstances surrounding Isabella's ex-husband's murder have two very plausible stories. Either Zevran had a contract and it was just a coincidence, and Isabella just got lucky or she was about to be sold by her husband to be used by his friend. And when Zevran heard about this, it pushed him over the edge and caused him to intervene. The difference being, of course, how much Isabella's involvement was. My glorious queen could do no wrong. And saving her was the best thing Zevran ever did in his goddamn yeah. career. Honestly, for that, I can agree, Big Dog, I might hate him, but whatever his intention was killing Isabella's ex was a massive W, both for the thirsty Dragon Age fans and our pirate girl here. Well, looks like it's the 1% of the episode where you and I agree, Sleepy. Now, Obama, please tell me you're not going to be a bitch, and you're about to take Isabella to Pound Town, right? We can do it in front of Morrigan to assert dominance. And Isabella has special dialogue in two if we do it. So if the sexy pirate doesn't get you off, I'm sure that special dialogue will. Actually, Donald, I brought Morrigan here to veto that decision. 
since I knew both of you degenerates would not be able to control ah, yourselves on your own. You have a duty. Morrigan is the only romance that can't be convinced to let you sleep I with Isabella or join in. I feel like most people do the threesome or foursome, so I want to showcase how to win the card game since it's the most mechanically interesting route. Are you fucking serious? I call myself a Obama, that is the most nerdy 40-year-old virgin sentence I have ever heard in my goddamn life. You are legit probably the only player that doesn't leap at the chance to bang the queen of the pirates. I literally had to listen to Joe last week talk about how he thinks he is better for the economy than the literal king of the deal, and somehow that was less fucking annoying. Then you fumbling to bang the hottest tavern wench in the series. Viewers, please dislike the video and unsubscribe now for this goddamn nerd. Barry, you're a total virgin, but please don't actually dislike the video viewers. I will cry if I don't get enough thumbs up my ass. Fun fact, though, if you propose a threesome as a female warden while romancing Liliana, and you have Ogren in the party, he will actually pass out because of how hot that is that three girls are about to bone. Holy W-based Uncle Oren strikes again. All right, Donald. I'm glad you got all that shit out so now you can cry and goon about it on your own time. Plus, I'd rather role-play my guy as being faithful in his relationship as well as not sleep with Isabella and catch whatever it is she might have we have a whole ass blight to stop, boys. Viewers, please tell me Barack is the only one who is a big enough virgin to actually play Yu-Gi-Oh with the hot girl instead of taking her to the back room when trying to get the duelist specialization. That's not good enough to be our comment question, but sure, let us know what you did, viewers. Anyway, there's a lot of ways to actually win here, though the check is pretty difficult on the first game. You can either use a dexterity check, a pickpocket check to get better cards, a stealth check to sneak a peek at her cards, or a cunning check allows you to figure out she's cheating. All of these checks get easier after the first game, and if you keep trying to duel her and loose eventually Leliana and Zevran will auto help you win. Funny to note, all of these involve some rogue traits. So this is basically a competition to show her how much of a top tier rogue you are. Even the three way involves a speech check based off cunning. I like how the rogue specializations are the only ones that are all accessible in any playthrough without having to make a evil choice. All the rogue specializations you can get through books or training, regardless of character. Both warriors and mages had to make an evil choice of either selling out Connor or poisoning the ashes if they wanted their full choice of specialization. Thankfully, Awakening gave the free eats choice of buying manuals. Typical Paragon, of course, you're afraid to drink the red slurp juice in Haven, as any true gamer should. Well, good job finishing this side quest in the most uncool way possible. Let's just go bully people. Now, I could use a distraction at the moment. Uh, with pleasure, Donald. You know, this is the second time this quest that these guys bring up a cut bit of content. Apparently, when Howe took over Daenerim, he brought in a lot of his soldiers which were likely you, former you amoral mercenaries. You're they are so out, infamous that even small-time criminal out. groups no, no, like these guys the are deathly afraid of them. It was a missed opportunity to bring this up in conversations, but not show us how bad Howe's soldiers are acting with a quest or interaction in the market, something that shows how bad Howe is for wardens that haven't done the human it. noble Good origin, see, sort of I, similar to how we saw I the Carta shaking down stores in Orzammar before we actually fought the Carta. Yeah, plus that would have given Human Noble a deeper interaction with the game, and it would have let us fuck with how more, which is a massive W for all players. Another I think Daenerim was the area they had least fleshed out since Not it didn't have a main quest until the very That's end of the game. The sure, they have some good quests, like Slim Coldry and the Anti-Vin quest line. That's a good point. And speaking of both Arl Howe and the anti Vin Crow quest line, let's go. Hit up the first quest in that chain. Viewers in the back rooms of the Pearl is where the first assassination target is located, who are actually assassins hired by Howe to kill us. In order to get to them, you have to find a wanted poster in the Denarum market that talks about Grey Warden supporters, which will give you the passphrase to reach them. I'm excited to kill more of Howe's men. I love wasting that snake's money. What is the point of that persuasion check, though it never actually stops them from attacking you? 
I have a feeling that was more cut content, something tells me, given Howe's importance during the land's meat portion. He was meant to play a bigger role in quests like these, like maybe you could have convinced them to back off or give you some information on how to take down Howe. Would have been interesting, but sadly nothing more than a theory for cut content at this point. You know, every time I see a Kunari mercenary after playing through Dragon Age 2, I like to think Sten would have called them a slur. Since Kunari do not think highly of Kunari, that leave the Kun. Too bad they don't have random banter during fights. I think that would have been a top tier feature. I can see it now, Sten berating Kunari mercenaries, calling them soulless, and Uncle Ogren could berate surface cast dwarfs and castless. That would be top tier. So since we kicked out the White Falcon bandits from the Pearl, we automatically get this random encounter in Daenerim where their leader will attack us. Fun fact coming from our longtime viewer, believe it, Sergeant Kylon here actually shares the same voice actor with Sten, which I didn't know because the dude clearly has some vocal range. Thanks for the fact, big dog. That's true, good shit, finding a fact even Barry didn't know. Here's another one that the viewers might not realize too, the leader of these bandits Kristoff has a really powerful axe on his possession. This axe not only has a unique look, but it also has the passive ability of attracting spirits and demons around it because of its power and unique origin based on its codex entry. Okay, that's a pretty dope fact for a unique weapon, but more importantly, Joe, since when can you explain shit like that in intricate detail? Your ass was doing the lead poisoning stare at the debate stand like you were a one charisma build New Vegas character. Okay, I guess while we kill these dudes, we can put this debate shit to rest. I want to compliment you both from sounding less like an old married couple and not constantly talking over and insulting each other. So congrats on being grown men for once, but did you two really just challenge each other to a 1v1 golf match to settle the presidency? What the fuck is wrong with the both of you? Obama, this dude really thinks he can out-golf the golfing master. I literally have spent the last eight years honing my craft, and this old fossil who can't even walk upstairs thinks he can clutch up against me. I like how you admitted to four years of presidency doing nothing but golf, but the funniest part is you still suck at it. Double D, you are the worst president on our presidential golf team. Me and Barry smoke you and George every damn game. And Barry even got one of George's oil fields because your ass was so in debt from losing hard. Hey now, boys, I know you all think you're uh, the shit, but don't forget that the top president in our golf team is Maury Goddamn Povich, president of TV. I would have interjected your bickering during the debate if that wasn't the funniest and pettiest shit I've seen on national television. What the fuck is happening right now? Maury, you know, I got the championship tournament wins on my own. Don't be like that. And the lie detector determined that was a lie bozo. You know, you swapped our scores on the very last hole. You can lie to something small like all of America, but don't lie on a small time YouTube channel. Donald, you are classier than that. I feel like these special guests get more contrived every episode. Maury, why are you here? Sorry, former President Barack Obama. It's just Donald's yapping triggered my lie detector test senses and I had to intervene. Wouldn't that happen any time, Donald lies Maury? No scrub, it only happens when someone lies while being filmed. Jesus, how are you this not caught up on the lore? It's all good, Joey. I will take my leave. But remember, I'm always watching boys. Let me know if you want me to DNA test someone, like maybe that Connor dude from last episode. Boys, seriously, how do I get Maury to like me? Apparently even George and Bill are friends with him. It's literally only me. We already went through this, Barry stop being a bitch and get more interests. Speaking of, let's get our viewers' interest up by finally finishing up in Daenerim. Yeah, I finished the second Sergeant Kylon quest and picked up the other two anti-van quests. So let's move on to the main objective of this episode, Wynn's personal quest. Once you are confronted by Wynn in camp with the conversation we saw at the start of the episode, the next time you bring her in the party in the world map, you'll see this scene where Darkspawn will attack your party. This scene has to be the biggest negative feat in all of Dragon Age Origins because how did our level 19 dwarf and my Queen Morrigan fall to a single goddamn fireball? Especially because we are a tank. We have shrugged off Dragon's fire. How did a dark spawn hit us that hard? Yeah, I got to admit this scene doesn't really hold up when you think about it. It would have been more interesting if Wynne was by herself and taken down before the warden could get to her. And instead of dying, she channels the spirit because making the main player weak like that isn't a good look. True that, 
but this encounter does give us one of the most overpowered abilities in the game vessel of spirit. Not only is it a free revive on Winna Healer, but it restores half her mana as well and increases her spell power on top of being an area of effect stun against enemies. Once the vessel is over, however, Win is susceptible to being one shot since she is stunned, as well as lowering her movement speed and defense. This ability does get way better after the upgrade when we complete her quest, but we will cover that when we get there. An overpowered ability for the goddamn queen of the mid characters, thanks a lot, Bioware. Even after reading all those buffs, I still see no reason to bring her over my beloved Morrigan. Literally because she can auto-revive and heal Bozo. Without her, we would literally be forced to down every single health potion. Skill issue, Joe just don't take damage. Also, I love the fact that once again, the Darkspawn are back to remind everyone who the main enemy in this game is. I love fighting Darkspawn for the 50th time this playthrough. Honestly, yeah, it's hard to miss Darkspawn in the later games. When Origins has them as literally every filler enemy, we have to have two Darkspawn ambushes for Wind's Quest alone. We still have a few areas that don't involve them, thankfully. Also, that's a new boss counter for me. We are all tied up now at 10. Oh yeah, we should talk about that. So we did the poll from last episode and after over 100 votes, the poll was basically dead even. So we won't count the Desire Demon fight as a boss counter, meaning we all now have 10. I just want to go on record though that I wasn't trying to wiggle my way out of the competition. I just wanted to ask if there should be an outlier for the two fights that literally have boss health if you fight them in a different area since it is gray no matter how you look at it. Yeah, whatever you're fucking wrong, Joe, and the viewers called you out for it. I'm glad Dragon Age fans aren't as biased as the goddamn Electoral College. Maybe our viewers should handle this year's election cycle. Bro just did a slurp with a twist on every viewer's schlong. Well now, we have to get through one of the longest dialogue chains in this entire game. We have to ask when, how she was chose by the Sprit of Faith and what her true regret is. I have been holding this one in the reserves for just this moment. And now it's time to pull out one of my biggest yap sessions to date. Oh shit, this may have been my fault. I remember all the way in episode two, making a comment about the Boroff competition between Barry and Wynn. I future sighted a little too close to the sun with this one boys. Jesus Christ, Joe, do you still have that lean? This is gonna be a long ass journey and I don't think I want to experience whatever this is sober. So Wynn's regret in Origins is essentially her first ever apprentice who ran away after not fitting into the circle tower, which was brought on after an argument between Wynn and the apprentice, since as an elf, he was not adjusted to living together with humans. The apprentice Anarin fled the circle and was hunted by the Templars and was believed to be killed, but the Templars never even told Wynn what happened to him. This greatly shaped Wynn's perspective on teaching her other apprentices as well as being a mentor to us, realizing that you can't force someone to teach when they don't have the right attitude to learn. While she obviously has regrets over how she handled Anarin, in reality, that's not her true regret or the reason her spirit is keeping her alive. Wynne's much bigger regret is that her son was taken from her at birth and she never was able to be in his life. And as such, despite being a caretaker for the next generation, she couldn't really help her own son, the most important person of all. Hold up, Wynn is an actual mother, not a surrogate grandma. So she is literally a gilf, a grandma I'd like too. Yes, yes, Jesus Christ, boys. If you go through all the banter between Wynn and Alistair, and oddly enough, only if you aren't a maid yourself, there's two party banter scenes where Wynn tells Alistair that she imagines her son grew up to be quite similar to Alistair. She reveals that she got pregnant while very young in the circle and that the child was taken by the Chantry as soon as she gave birth to him. She also admits she thinks about him all the time, so it's certainly something she does regret. The story of her son is detailed through Dragon Age, a Sunder novel, where Wynne's son Reese and Wynne are primary characters. Oh, Jesus Christ, more novel shit that wasn't included in the main games. At least this is based off lore that was presented in the base game of Origins. It wasn't just spawned into existence. So how does this relate to Wind Spirit Barry? Oh, God damn it, Joe, don't encourage him. Well, spoilers for Dragon Age Asunder, if you don't mind, viewers. But Reese and Wynn embark on a quest to cure a tranquil mage who has possessed something that on the surface should be impossible. 
After curing the possession, Reese and Wynne learned from the Tranquil that curing tranquility is entirely possible if the Tranquil's mind is touched by a spirit. This is something we learned from Cassandra in Inquisition as well from Lord Seeker Lambert. While on this quest, Reese falls in love with a Templar Evangeline who gets into combat with the Lord Seeker and dies as the Lord Seeker is trying to secure the information of the tranquil cure from the public. Wynne transfers the spirit that she is carrying to Evangeline to save his son's lover, killing Wynne in the process, but bringing this spirit situation full circle, finally doing something for the son she couldn't raise her one true regret. Holy shit, who is cutting onions in this goddamn Oval Office? There's no way in hell some old fossil is making me cry right now. They really went the long con with that story arc. Do we know what happened to Wynn's son and his girlfriend, Barry? No, they do join the Inquisition as a small side quest. And we can assume Evangeline now is in the same state as Wynn, where the spirit is keeping her alive, but we don't have any more information than that, Reese would have been a perfect narrative companion for the next installment, considering he is just as strong as Wynne, and he is spirit sensitive, which would have been very relevant for the whole Vale Tear situation in Vale Guard, but I guess it just wasn't meant to be. So wait, if that was the biggest regret in Wynne's life, then why does this whole quest with an Aaron actually improve the power of Vessel of Spirit and give Wynne a sense of peace, Barry? Poor script writing, I'm sure our editor knows a thing or two about that. That's Fair Spirit's work in pretty mysterious ways. Anyway, Barry, we still have a long way to go through this win conversation, so I think this is the best time to ask if you have a comment question prepped for us. Shoot, we haven't had a proper comment question in a while after our special episode, so let's start with a simple one today, but one that is certainly opinionated. Viewers, who is your absolute favorite companion in Dragon Age? Wait, we've done almost 20 damn episodes of Dragon Age videos, and we haven't asked people who their favorite is yet. How the hell did we manage that? I was saving it for a rainy day, Donald. But on to the question, I would have to give my favorite companion to Cassandra. She is someone who I actively didn't trust or liked because of how she was portrayed almost as antagonist in her introduction in two. But over time, she really grew on me because of how real she is. She is someone who speaks her mind and challenges opposing ideas, essentially wearing her heart on her sleeve which is ironic because there's an armor upgrade that actually gives her hearts on her armor, which shows her nerdy romantic side, which is absolutely my favorite aspect of her character because it's so simple but unexpected. Cassandra is someone who has no hidden agendas, she doesn't mince her words, and she's totally emotionally honest instead of someone who thrusts all her past trauma on the main character like so many other Bioware companions. She's not perfect by far, but she tries, and that's why she's my favorite. Damn, that was beautiful, Barry. You're really hitting it home today. Well, my favorite companion is by far Liliana. Shocker. Fight me, Donald. Liliana is my favorite. Because despite having an absolute banger of a tragic origin story, she is still a good person, despite getting dealt a traumatic past. How many times in anime do characters have a rough life and a deep personal betrayal and turn into a villain? But Liliana overcomes this to still be a good person, even if you can harden her in both games, which is another reason she is my favorite. Hardening her still doesn't make her a bad person. She is still a morally good person. She just has a renegade streak about her, similar to Shepard in early Mass Effect games. Yes, and not one Why viewer was shocked to hear that. Anyways, boys, my absolute goaded choice for best companion is my beloved wife, Morrigan. Not only is she a 20 out of 10 in the looks department and the absolute strongest mage companion, but she is just as pivotal to the story of Origins as Alistair and our warden are. She is one of the two OG squad mates after the tutorial ends and she offers your warden the chance to live and become the hero of Ferelden without a sacrifice being needed, which is important because both Alistair and your warden become pivotal characters in the later series. Speaking of the later series, Morrigan's growth in Inquisition is amazing, as while she's still a badass Darwinist at heart, she grows to care for her lover and child deeply if you pushed her down that path. She's a smart, beautiful badass, and if she isn't in Veilguard, I am going to fucking overturn BioWare headquarters.
Wait, hold on. Did we seriously all pick our favorite romance options from the episode seven comment question as our Stop favorite right companions there, as well? Yeah, David, can't say I'm surprised with I that. Joe Romance is a very good link to what character a player I usually likes. I imagine some of our viewers will have the same reaction, like but some might still have different opinions. So viewers, let us know in the comments below. As always, our editor will respond to How every comment, and his favorite will be featured next episode. And with that, Joe Mind showing us the featured comment from in last camp. episode. Our featured comment comes from Desi542, whose dream team is Alistair Fenris Blackwall Morgan, Dorian Merrill, Cole, Varick, and Isabella, which has a great mix of all our personal presidential picks. But it wasn't just the team composition that had us feature this, because we had tons of goaded teams last episode. Y'all are amazing, by the way. The reason we featured it is because Bro wrote an entire doctoral thesis on each of their team picks. Like, we couldn't even fit all of their comment on the screen. So we just clipped the first segment. But thank you for that level of detail. It got Barry and our editor absolutely bricked up, and we can't wait to see your opinion on your favorite companion, Big Dog. Well, with the comment question done, let's move back to the plot. Interesting to note how unlike every other main quest area where they give you the chance to run around a little before being sucked into the plot, the Dalish camp sucks you immediately into what's going on here. That's a good point. The Circle Tower and Orzammar give you the docks and gates of Orzammar, respectively, to run around and explore freely before you get down to the plot. And even Redcliffe and Haven, which suck you in very early on arrival, still give your character some movement to run around first. But the Dalish camp just auto-warps you to plot immediately, kind of like they wanted to get it out of the way. Also, here we have another filthy apostate, who just happens to be shaped like an elven egg. This will be excellent scene. practice for what's going to happen in Veilguard, boys. Do you think I could find a curb in the middle of this forest? Barry, I think we should switch the turn order. I don't like Donald's aura right now. No, Joe, we can't keep changing the rules. The viewers already get on your case enough for that. Whatever choice. Donald decides we will just have to abide by, as we will still have our last army choice locked in. Oh, absolutely, we will have that anyways. Werewolves are something we really only see in Origins, and I really wish we could see a next-gen variant of these guys in future games. But werewolves are sort of underrated in the Ferelden lore. They actually have huge tie-ins to Ferelden's early days, and they are the reasons the Kozlans are Terrans on equal status with low gain. Since the Kozlans achieved that rank of nobility by uniting the lands against werewolves, as there was a lycanthrope plague hundreds of years ago in Ferelden. Jesus Christ twice in one episode with the Donald lore drops what is happening. Good shit, Donald. You're right on the money with that one. Realistically, werewolves being a plague or commonplace in Thetis makes sense given the fact that all it takes is a spirit to take hold of a wolf in order to spread the werewolf curse. And just like the Darkspawn curse, it's very easy to spread in mortals, though obviously in game we are immune to actual in-game effects of the disease, probably because that would be annoying. Werewolves also were able to take the form of humans to blend perfectly in society according to lore, but we don't see that in game either. Moving further onto the Ferelden relevance of werewolves, the ability of normal dogs like Mabari to detect a werewolf, even when it is in human form, is what first led Ferelden's to adopt dogs as indispensable companions in everyday society and why the phrase Ferelden smells like wet dog becomes so common. The alliance between humans and regular wolves is also the subject of the popular Ferelden folktale Dane and the Werewolf. Good yapping on both ends, boys. Also on the funnier side of things, if we brought Bo with us. When we first meet Zatharin, he gets annoyed at seeing more dogs in this forest too bad. We missed it. It's a really funny troll move. God, you are such a child, Joe. Anyways, Barack, how much of this forest do you plan on doing? I want to prepare myself for next episode. Right, good call. It always helps the boys out as well as the viewers to get our game plan laid out. So my main objective is to reach Anarin in the forest, which means I will have to clear a pretty good portion of the forest. I would say I will tackle about 50% of the forest this episode. Then, Donald, you can cover the other 50% of the forest and then finish the elven ruins to wrap up the rest of this quest. Oh, I hate that goddamn ruin with every fiber of my gamer being. Thanks for that, Obama. 
but whatever, I will still make the most out of this shit sandwich and still be a man of the people. Speaking of as a man of the people, we're going to have to find this dude's wife for him. Good point. This side quest can have importance in Dragon Age 2, so we might as well start it up. Plus, Athras here is voiced by Mark Mir. One of his only two roles in Dragon Age, the other is coming up shortly. Oh, shit. Well, now we definitely have to go help Commander Shepard's wife. Otherwise, how are we going to know what stores in the Citadel are his favorite? I feel like these side quests are nowhere near as interesting as Orzammar's or Red Cliff's, since there isn't that much player agency. There's usually only one option to complete the quest, or just the option to not complete it at all. Yeah, I think the Dalish side quests are the weakest quests overall because of little player agency in the quests. Still there's a few highlights here as always. Most notably, the Kamen quest has quite a few unique interactions, even options that vary by the warden's gender. There's the arcane warrior specialization and the mage's treasure, which has us fighting multiple revenant bosses for a top tier armor as well as a very interesting lore drop. Finally, the merchant has the best supply of crafting materials in the game, including an unlimited supply of elf root. Which means, of course, Obama is about to blow all our hard-earned money on it. At least we can be wasteful next episode with the potions. Hey, now let's not get crazy. We still have plenty of difficult fights ahead of us. We are going to need those potions. Sounds like a personal problem. I do what I want. Okay, ladies, an interesting fact about the Dalish camp is that the camp itself has a hidden approval meter depending on race and your interactions with the camp. Not only will this change how NPCs in the camp greet you, but it also affects if Varathorn the merchant will trade with you, and it also affects the easiness of speech checks around camp. How you gain these points is essentially just completing the side quests in this camp in a way that benefit the quest giver. Lose enough points and you can't trade with them anymore. Humans, I believe, start at lower points than other races and can fall more easily into being locked out of trade. Yeah, I had that happen once when I first came in. It was annoying as hell. Like, just give me the damn elf root, old man. Skill issue. Well, I'm sure you appreciate that every Dalish camp has a lore keeper, Barry. That's the shit you like after all. All right, I will roll with it. We have a few story times we have to get through before we can ask the storyteller about Anarin to proceed Wynn's quest. So tell me, boys, how much do you know about Dalish history? I know everything Merrill tells us about the Dread Wolf and Mithil, but that's about it. I know enough to tell that they don't actually know shit about ancient elves and that they're kind of just dicks for the sake of it. All right, then. Well, the Dalish history is almost entirely tied up in the formation of the Andrastian religion. Shartan, along with Andrasta, rallied elven slaves in a war against Tevener. This, of course, didn't end up well for Andraste. But her husband, Mafarath, persisted in the war after her death and eventually freed the slaves and granted them the land in the Dales in his wife's honor. They lived in the Dales for about three centuries without any issue. But when the Orlesian Empire formed under the banner of unifying a singular Andrastian religion among the lands, the Dalish were a primary target, being a land that still worshipped multiple gods. There was a major war and the Dalish people even sacked Val Royale at one point, but obviously they did not have the numbers to take on the whole empire, and the exalted march eventually destroyed the Dales, forcing the clans to disperse into now nomadic tribes, where the purpose is to hold on to any bit of ancient elven society they can. This exalted march also led to the practice of pushing elves into alienages and forcing them to worship Andraste, as the original elves from alienages are elves that surrendered to the exalted march and Orlesian Empire, probably why many Dalish clans have disdain for city elves and even have a slur for them, which is flat ears. Damn, so they really had all this death and destruction over gods that aren't even real. They should have just dropped the petty shit and worshiped the one true religion of enchantment. I guess that's one way to look at it. Well, I appreciate the outberry. Overall, though, I just like how the Dalish try to mimic their own ancient culture. And in doing so, they actually have formed their very own culture that is very distinct from the elves of Arlathan and the Dales. At least that's what we learn in the later games. Also, when Sten hears the story here that the lore keeper is telling, he has a funny reaction, saying that the Kunari would have improved their people. The humans have done nothing. Stan is super based as always. 
also Jesus Christ. We went through that whole yap session and this dude is still going on. What in the yap section is this? As I said, he has two whole stories to get through. In exchange for hearing about the Dales, he is going to tell us more about the Brazilian forest we are about to enter. A yap for a yap. What kind of Obama currency do these elves have going on here? Viewers drinking game take a shot every time someone says the word yap. Please don't do that, viewers. You will actually die, and we can't encourage reckless drinking like that. Pussy. Well, the Cliff Notes version of the history of this forest is that during the time before Andraste, when Tevin Ter occupied Ferelden, there was a great war in this forest, likely between the ancient elves and Tevin Ter. So much death caused spirits to be attracted to the forest and tear the veil enough so that spirits could possess the trees and animals in the forest. We will learn more about this war during the mage's treasure quest. I'm just in it for the loot, but I know I have to hear about it to get the cool armor, so I guess it's the compromise I have to pay. you trying to find him, but what are the chances? Well, we can finally ask him about Anarin. Apparently the dude is still alive and just chilling in the woods. Yeah, wait, how did that work? Did the Templars just fuck up hunting him again like they did? Joan, Ferelden Templars are really just making the rest of us look like shit. Well, when you have a job that gives you authority over a group of people, it's only natural. Some will care more about torturing said people than actually the duty they are sworn into. A little too real with that one, Joe. Well, I guess there is only one way to find out. Peep this transition. Let's head into the woods, boys. Look, Donald, it's dogs, your favorite. These are not the kind of good boys I like. Also looks like I'm gonna have to take back that shit about the Red Cliff sword being trash because I'm pretty sure half the things in here are considered beasts. Well, Topsider's honor is still the better choice because almost everything in the ruins is actually undead, so our stocks are still safe as far as that is concerned. Also, it's an interesting lore touch that they paired regular wolves with werewolves. I wonder if some of these wolves are possessed by spirits, and that's why they are helping the werewolves. They are probably just chill with the Lady of the Forest, and she asked them for help, but we will get to that later. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Either way, it's overwhelmed city up in here because every single beast has the same damn ability, regardless if it's a wolf, spider, or hentai tentacle. And at our level, it isn't so much lethal as it is just inconvenient. Looks like the furries want more smoke. What a scenic ass place to square up. At least these doggos have good taste. Oh shit, they are talking, boys. Maybe we should ask them if they want some nug nuggets. Donald's first reaction to meeting new sentient life is to offer it McDonald's. Look when the aliens arrive and I offer them a huge tray of cheeseburgers. You nerds can all thank me when they return with some hot blue alien girls and not the Death Star. All right, boys. If we can get back on track here, this encounter is one of the multiple dozen that does address our warden's race. Right now, the werewolves are confused as hell at seeing a dwarf in the forests. However, they kind of spoil the plot a little if you are a human warden. Since they will say it's really ironic, the Dalish send a human to take out the werewolves. They really put up a huge sign off the bat that shit is wrong here. Zatharin says they are mindless beasts, but they were able to organize an ambush, and now they are able to have better conversations with us than Joe on the debate stand. Eat a dick. It only gets more suspicious when we do one of the side quests for the camp in a moment involving Athras and his wife. We can skip this fight thanks to our coercion skill stocks, but it really isn't a tough fight. The wolves fuck off as soon as Swift Runner gets a few boo-boos. The werewolves in this game still have better stocks than those pissant companions from Skyrim. Oh, I'm a leader of the inner circle and a trained combat veteran of over 40 years with a werewolf buff, but I still got clapped up by a few bandits with silver swords. Give me a damn break. You fell back into the Skyrim rabbit hole again, didn't you, Donald? It's a cozy game, and I've been going through a lot. There's only so much McNuggets, and it be like that sometimes as a man can use. So Swift Runner's group didn't want to fight, but these werewolves 30 feet away are more than happy to run into the meat tenderizer that is our high-level warden. Well, go off, Kings. POV, it's 2009, and you just said you're an Edward fan in eighth grade English class. I could say a lot about your 60-something ass being in an eighth grade English class sleepy, but you actually got a dry chuckle out of me with that one. Also, hang on, did they include werewolves in this fantasy game to try and attract goddamn Twilight fans? This game came out the same time as New Moon. This game came out before New Moon, so I think it's just a coincidence. Plus, I'm sure this quest was developed long before Twilight. 
even plagued the United States. Now looking at Skyrim, and you might be onto something, boys. Anyways, I'm glad I can finally show the viewers how overpowered dual wield rogues are. I think we haven't really been able to highlight that. Since this is only the second time this playthrough we've used Zevran. Just a tip for viewers getting back into Origins for the first time in forever because of our playthrough. A max dexterity dual wield rogue with stealth capabilities is a really strong build on even high difficulties. Get assassin and duelist and some high level poisons and you might be able to solo even the toughest fights. It's really strong and it's a little more engaging than certain mage playthroughs. If I had a nickel for every bloody, mostly dead scout I found in the woods and had to heal up in this game, I would have two nickels. Viewers, you know the rest. I don't remember that animation there. Is that something the restoration patch added, Barry? I think so. I don't remember it either in Base Origins. It looks like Spirit Healer was going to have a large impact on certain quests, which makes sense. Win is a strong enough healer that getting this guy stable enough to walk should be child's play. We should have looted his Jordans first. They are pretty good giving plus two to Constitution. He also has a figure we could use later on, but I guess we just don't want it. I don't think stealing from their scouts is going to earn many brownie points from the Dalish Joe, so I'd rather just send him on his way and keep it pushing. Though I will say, it doesn't matter too much building up camp approval because it can be cheesed by simply giving them the iron bark up ahead without asking for a reward. Doing that guarantees Varathorn will trade with you regardless of every other quest decision you make, even if you're straight up assholes to them. Well, before we get the iron bark, we have to deal with the dark spawn reminding us they are the main villains for the 18th time this playthrough. Why are the dark spawn even here theirs? Nothing for them to pillage except the Dalish. Maybe they got lost on their way to Daenerim. Honestly, that would be pretty relatable. Maybe the archdemon is bitching directions at them too, trying to get them back with the main horde. Something tells me you're taking that more to heart than you realize, Joe, but honestly, I feel like they just sprinkled in dark spawn in this area because it's the obvious enemy choice. And again, just to remind players, this is a blight. And these darkspawn are spreading out while we gather our armies. Got to build the tension somehow, I guess. Uh, also, this grave site is where one of the armor pieces for the mage's treasure quest. You're gonna start those now, Barak. They have boss health too. Oh, actually, Donald, technically you can't start that quest with this grave site. There is a specific one you need to disturb first to trigger the other two. I think that will be the last thing I handle this episode just to kick things off for you to finish the other grave sites easier. That oh, actually felt like such a nerd emoji moment, Barry. Eat a dick, Joe. Well, I'm thankful for your nerd knowledge, Barack, especially since it means I can get plenty of boss counters next episode. Ironbark for the quest up ahead, but oh, here's the Sylvans, a very welcome sight. Oh, absolutely. The Sylvans are probably top five on my bucket list for remastered enemies in Veilguard. They have a unique look and combat style, and they have a cool premise pretending to be a regular tree lying in wait for ambush, like we see here. Unfortunately, the game doesn't really do this mechanic justice, since the Sylvans are so distinct from normal trees that a player can't be ambushed by them more than once unless they're not paying attention. I really like the way they fight too, rooting half our party and giving them a powerful back kick like they are Chuck Norris. Damn what an ancient throwback, Sleepy. But as much as I love the Goat Inquisition, I feel like it was a missed opportunity to not have Sylvans in the Hinterlands or Emerald Graves, especially since both those areas like this forest were sites of war and large battles which thinned the veil. Plus, having to dodge their root attacks would have worked really well with the new engine sort of a rip-off, being honest. Well, at least we get to see them plenty in Origins and Awakening. I have to say, though, Bioware really knows how to create fantasy forests from a design perspective. I feel like between the two forests in this game and the massive forest in the Hinterlands in Inquisition, some of the design team members must really have a passion for forests. I wonder if it's the same dude who designed the Oblivion Forests, they all just feel very vibrant and lush, like I'm exploring the woods as a kid again. The music really helps that feeling too, making it playful and foreboding. 
Joe, I'm positive you plagiarized that shit from some other video, you sleepy fuck. That being said, you are strangely right about every ounce you just yapped about. I just watched a few gameplay analysis videos while I practiced for the debate. Some of those videos really help get your feelings out in a more verbose manner. I swear, though, everything I just said was 100% original, boys. Well, I'm stunned but impressed anyways. Looks like one of the dogs is willing to be chill with us. It's crazy how revealing this conversation is to the main plot since she reveals that the werewolves are changed and that Witherfang leads them and is not what the Dalish thinks she is, but you can technically skip this cutscene and never encounter her while still finishing the main quest. Since there are technically two paths into this side of the forest, you can enter the next part of the forest while never encountering her. Is there any way to save her berry? She isn't looking too good. Well, by talking to her, we have essentially relegated her fate to being put down. Unfortunately, we either can agree to put her out of her misery, and if we don't, she will attack us seemingly because the curse takes over and forces her to, since she fled Witherfang's protection from the mental effects of the curse. Technically, there is a happy ending here. If you don't encounter her, if you cure the werewolf curse, then go back to Athras. He will say he is going into the forest to find his wife. Since she would be cured with everyone else, it's just possible she is lost in the woods now. So basically, because we interfered, we made things worse for them. I like that it's the same thing as the Blackstone quests. Just mindlessly doing them is the wrong decision from the outside looking in. Yeah, and now we have left some Dalish girl without her mom and seeking revenge in Dragon Age 2, depending on what her choices are later. I always found it weird that the main Dalish quest in Origins has three branching choices in Dragon Age 2. It definitely offers replayability, but it also makes every other import quest pale in comparison to this choice. Careful Joe commenters are catching on that you're just plagiarizing our editor's Dragon Age 2 analysis video. Democrats try not to shill for our editor's video challenge impossible. Also, rest in peace, Danelia, you deserve better. We will tell your husband you died thinking of him, poor girl. Uh, Barack Joe's son just teleported in front of us. Hunter, what did I say about going into the forest when you're off the, uh, I mean, shut up, Donald. We must again ignore the mentally insane for the moment, Donald. We are on a mission just past the crazy guy. I guess Anarin must be roommates with him or something. This reunion is pretty sweet, actually. So wait, the Templars just stabbed him and left him bleeding out. What assholes just finished the job you're getting paid to do nothing worse than an inefficient Templar? This is why we have Teventer still thriving in a steampunk future. How is that the takeaway Donald, instead of maybe having an order that doesn't kill mages first and ask questions later? Sounds like these two were just dark urge players who wanted to act out on killing someone legally. Skill issue, Joe. Most mages just need a good killing. Anarin is a pretty chill guy. He just kind of blows off their past and wishes her well. He doesn't even seem that mad about being left for dead by the Templars. I think Bro has some kind of self-actualization going on, where he's reached his peak living among the forest as a wandering healer. Why doesn't he just live with the Dalish? Well, he simply just doesn't feel connected to the Dalish, which makes sense, given how most Dalish are not welcoming of outsiders, including elves raised alongside humans. Also, the token he gives us unlocks an upgrade for Vessel of the Spirit, where instead of restoring 50% of health and mana during the revive, the token restores 100% of health and mana. And also, the stun is removed when the spell ends. So it's just an overall major buff to this ability. Best of all, you don't need to equip it on win to get the buff. You just have to have the item in your inventory and not equip it on anyone else. Again, a super overpowered ability for an incredibly mid-character, at least her arc is finished with. And that conversation was super quick compared to Liliana's and Morrigan's side quest. Wow, you're such a ray of sunshine, Donald, but I do agree that confrontation with Anarin was two minutes long, which is crazy since we spent like 20 minutes this episode doing the build-up for this quest, only for that to be the conclusion. I guess all we have left to do this episode is talk to the crazy guy. What lore do you got on this guy, Barry? A question for a question, answer for answer. Is this dude acoustic or a politician? I mean, both probably. But to answer your question, Joe, there's a lot to say about this guy, even though there's literally nothing we can get out of him personally. No. 
Zathrin tells us that he had a tower in the forest, but it mysteriously vanished. Considering we see him teleport out of a stump, we can assume he somehow transported his tower into the stump. Zathrin can also tell us that he is a Shemlin blood mage hiding from the Chantry, and we can see several Templar bodies littered around the forest, so we can assume that the they he is referring to is the Templars. Also, we can get two interesting items if we barter with him. We can get an elven helmet that gives 20% spirit resistance, really useful for fighting the Archdemon and most mages. We can also trade him for a book, which gives us a codex entry on some Tevinter relics that are in game rings we can find. Also, everything we can use to trade with him are items we find around the forest doing side quests, such as the scarf Danelia gives us, Dagon's boots, or Halla carving, or two Dalish books we can get in camp. This guy is also one of the two people we can side with to get past the forest barrier guarding the werewolves. We can side with him or the rhyming tree, and knowing how these two operate, I can already tell they are going to help the blood mage and probably forgive his student loans too. Oh, hell no, I brought Zevran into the woods for a reason, Donald. I'm siding with my boy rhyming tree. Bro's been on SoundCloud for 15 years and he still hasn't caught his big break. I gotta respect it. I'm actually surprised you made the right decision for once. Also, oh right, this scene I almost forgot. When was the last time I slipped my hand into some dark hole? Hmm. I remember a long story, that. And there we go. I bet Barry he wishes he was that trapped. tree stump right but I'm now. Too awesome I mean, don't we all? Heavy pause. Phrasing, please, for the love of God. Yeah, I'm the master of phrasing. You can't, you know, reverse card me, Joe. It was a joke. Barry, not a damn viewer, is going to believe that's a joke. Not after all the receipts we have in this playthrough. I feel like Zevran and Wynn have just been carrying the content this episode, which is probably a good thing, considering they have been more pushed to the side in this playthrough so far. Well, that's a good thing, since I'm sure every companion has a few fans out there. Considering the last two characters who still have arcs are Zevran and Ogren, I'm sure we have at least one more companion-focused episode in us. Well, I guess the crazy dude proved how much of a blood mage he is by immediately summoning demons off the bat. Also, this fight seems more intense than I remember it. I usually just meant to clash him and then Cone of Cold the demons. My beloved Morrigan could have clutched up the W while everyone else took a break, but Barack has a massive skill issue. Yeah, if I was being optimal, I would have grabbed Morrigan for this instead of win, but we were already here and content as king boys. Also, yes, for those confused mana clash allows you to drain all the mana of a enemy and then deal spirit damage proportionate to how much mana they lost. For spellcaster bosses, like the Mad Hermit, this makes them completely one-shottable. It, of course, is useless on any boss that doesn't use mana, though. Situations where, considering if the point investment is worth it, is one of the many reasons why I love Origins gameplay, and ever more excited for the magic skill tier list when we get to it. Yeah, hurry up and do a mage playthrough so we can test out shit, Joe. Yeah, this is the one and only time my mage love is useful to you, Donald, so I will get to it when I get to it. I got a lot to manage right now between this series, Sunday White House ice cream banquets, and this election, too. I guess the importance, of course, being in that order. Just hurry it up. I need to show them I am a man of the people before November and tier lists seem to be the way to do it, considering the alternate realities where we do those blow up crazier than a McDonald's with Chezwan sauce. Anyway, this puts me ahead one boss on the boss counter, so why don't we add one more to that total before we close this video out. The first grave site you have to disturb to start the mage's treasure quest is right here in the corner of the forest, right down from the hermit's camp. Each of these have a revenant boss fight which if you're doing the Dalish quest line first can be a really difficult fight considering how much damage revenants do, but considering how much of a unit we are now. And with Topsider's honor, this should be a quick fight. Jesus Christ, it's like a calculus equation every time you attack those undead with all those numbers popping up. Yeah, this will be Jova real quick. Are you gonna yap about the history of the juggernaut armor, Barak? No, I need to save some of my material for next episode, boys. I'm sure you have just as long of an episode as I have Donald. He used up too much of his yap energy. He needs to wait for the cooldowns to refresh now. That's fair. Viewers get excited because I'm about to finally get a major main quest decision of my very own, so look out for it. Joe, before next week, you want to finally settle the golf 1v1? Bring it, pussy. And 
they left already. All right. Well, viewers, thank you so much for watching and making it to the end of the episode. Don't forget to drop a like, to thumb my ass or whatever, as well as subscribe if you made it this far. It really helps us keep building a Dragon Age community, which as always helps push our editor towards making these videos faster. Don't forget to leave your comment question on who your favorite Dragon Age companion is as well. Next episode, Donald will wrap up the Dalish Elf quest line also. It's our editor's birthday this week, so if you made it to the end, comment happy birthday if you want. But for now, stay safe, Obama out.